good morning thank you for uh, you know coming together and doing this um, so devnil i would like to introduce you to arjun been in medtech for a very long time and in the leadership positions and uh, arjun devnil of course uh, self made person um, uh, started off in banks and now he has his own very very successful fund he's done some fabulous investments and i would of course want devnil to take us uh, through in detail uh, on that so let's talk about uh, a bit of that as to what interested you uh, you know to the industries where you are so uh, uh, arjun why, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, medtech and uh, what attracted you to medtech okay hey thanks shital and they've been very nice to meet you pleasure uh, i th i think shital i have had i've been very fortunate to have a very nice uh, career i left india in the mid 80s uh, to go and study in the uk and uh, post that i've had a, a career that's taken me uh, to a number of places and given me the opportunity to live and work in uh, nine countries and across multiple industry sectors uh, but why medtech that's interesting in itself uh, i i joined in 2006 in as a, in a financial role and initially uh, my attraction was it was a long cycle industry i've been in many industries where it was sort short cycle so you do a lot of great plans we think about making it happen and then an industry downturn would come and we go scrambling and start hankering for cover and uh, you know just surviving and all those plans were put to bed i thought medtech was insulated against that but the real gratification came and this will sound very cliche is that once i got in i realized how much we could impact lives through the work that we did and that was very powerful and that's probably one of the reasons i've stuck around for about 16 years within medtech no oh, that's fabulous yeah 16 years is a long time yeah yeah good so yeah devnil now if you can just you know give us some insight on on uh, you know why did you choose uh, uh, tech startups and what has interested you to continue in this site right so um, i have always been uh, very intrigued by sustainability quite early in the day and today it's uh, it's rather very commonly used uh, but uh, say about uh, 30 years back when I started my career, um, it was, uh, even I didn't uh, know it in the form and shape uh, and in terms that I know it today. And that brought me or attracted me to good companies way before I even started my professional career. I was still studying and I have not taken up, decided to take up finance as a field. And um, uh, and then I, I, what took me there is that I realized that good companies are built to last. And if you can find a methodology to find out this built to last businesses, then you have a very long play. And therefore your money works much harder than you and you can ride on the power of compounding. And that's where, you know, got into me how to figure out um, companies that we can, uh, get into and for that we i realized that the most important thing is curiosity i must be extremely curious to see things which is not obvious because crowd obvious is a crowded space and the crowded space is either fully valued or overvalued so you have to be a contrarian you have to be uh, places that are seldom traveled at the same time you have to be right because if you are contrarian uh, you have left the crowded space you have let uh, uh, the the binge and then gone into somewhere else and then um, either you are ahead of time or you are um, at a wrong place then it's going to be more fatal and it has uh, over the years uh, uh, the curiosity and the calibration has worked for me the second thing i realize is that um, in life in business in investing most important thing is the courage you have to be uh, very courageous when people are fearful and when you have to be extremely fearful when people are uh, overtly courageous or exuberant. Um, and that's where I think those uh, uh, times have worked. And then I realized that, so curiosity, courage, the most important thing thereafter is the patience. Most people um, are curious, many people are courageous, but uh, very few are patient. Um, after a while or with the first storm brewing, they see a lot of profit has grown in there and they cut, uh, cut their profits uh, instead of cutting their losses. So these are some of the mistakes, pitfalls that I've tried to avoid. And that has taken me through this journey. And, and over the years, it has got formalized 
into a um, into a funding journey and there again if you see the most value today is created by technology and technology in the private space and that's where you know um over the years i have gravitated towards private and tech so uh, arjun now um, you've been in the medtech uh, for a long time how do you see technology playing uh, in in this industry what is the uh, involvement of technology there so uh, uh and Damien, if you allow me to digress a little bit, let me take a step back and talk about what MedTech is all about. Um, you know, when we talk about the healthcare space or life sciences, as many people call it, uh, there are a number of verticals. You have uh, pharmaceuticals, probably the best known. And let me compare and contrast a little bit. Uh, pharmaceutical is really finding solutions for health issues via chemistry. So, you know, you have a chemical or a molecule and you use that to fix a certain disease or cure a certain disease. Medical technology or med tech as known, it's more about engineering. So here the collaboration between the physician and the engineer is very important. And that is used to cure diseases. Uh, so uh, from a med tech point of view, I would say the runway is very, very long. Okay, there are still many, many diseases for which we don't have adequate treatment today or the right outcome today. So I think there is still plenty of runway to go and identify those diseases and find solutions to it. Uh, but at the same time, I think like any industry, we are facing our own challenges within uh, this. And uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, you know, although healthcare has made a lot of progress in the last 30 years, um, the disease burden is no less than what it was 30 years ago. Uh, if you look at it, well, the disease burden that uh, the countries and individuals are fighting is still very, very high. Uh, now, partly this is because of aging population. So people are living longer today than they were 20 years ago. So on average, people are living five years longer than what they did 20 years ago. So there's the burden of aging population, which predominantly chronic diseases are significantly on the rise. So how do you cope with that? Secondly, it's the advent of lifestyle related diseases, you know, diabetes, hypertension, uh, obesity, neurological disorders, they are all coming to the forefront now than ever before as real issues to grapple with. What role does technology play there uh, to drive solutions uh, in that area? Add to that the bigger complex around access and affordability. And let me elaborate that a little bit more. Um, you know, even today, more than half the world's population do not have access to proper healthcare facilities, maybe due to the lack of hospital beds, uh, maybe due to the lack of hospitals itself or the lack of doctors. So they're not getting access to hospitals. And second part is they don't have the dollars to spend on the traditional treatments that are being dished out. So there is a lot more that can be done there in terms of expanding access and making healthcare more affordable. Now, this problem is more acute in emerging markets, but it's not alien in the developed markets either. Yeah, so I think, uh, Devnil, you, you've had some experience with MedTech. The, you know, uh, you've kind of, I think, uh, interacted with some startups who are dealing with MedTech and, and Gene. I, I remember you saying that. So would you like to uh, elaborate on that? Sure, sure. I think uh, so far, uh, uh, you know, um, we have had uh, twofold of uh, interactions uh, with uh, medtech. One is the really the medtech where it is basically the confluence of uh, uh, the doctor and uh, technology, and how to make things more efficient, where we can increase the throughput, and and where we can make things uh, more accurate and more but less burdensome. So if I may say the same word, dull, the dangerous and the dirty part of the medical science, uh, if we can take out and make the machines do it. So one of our early forays were an Israeli um, company that was automating diagnostics uh, using AI and machine learning. And if you really look at it, uh, best of the ophthalmologists, maybe 90% of the time they will get a diabetic retinopathy correct. Um, but then machine will get it right 99% of the time. And more importantly, you know, as we are aging and we are living longer, medical science is making stupendous progress. We have better health standards. We have uh, uh, better uh, awareness. Um, today, more than uh, um, 
actual curation or curative medication, the preventive medication has become much more predominant. And for that part, you need more diagnostics. So today, most expenses are being incurred all over the world. If you look at the pattern, whether it's government, whether it's insurance companies, it's mostly on the diagnostics. And if you can, and there's a huge short supply of people who actually are the backbone of diagnostics, right, radiologists. So if we can uh, really take that out and put it into the machine, there is no fatigue. The machines can compare millions of patterns in fraction of a second. So therefore, for them to make a wrong diagnostics is almost like uh, a very remote uh, eventuality. And hence, uh, that part of it, you can bring down the cost significantly. And therefore, the whole uh, process much more, uh, the throughput of the whole process can become much more efficient. And when you have more faster, speed, cheaper, and better diagnostics available, it's easy for the doctors to quickly come into a, diag uh, a diagnosis. Because medical, again, there's a lot of intuitiveness that goes in. Like when I'm seeing a doctor, the questions he asks and the answers I give are the most important. If I give him in incorrect answers, he will have wrong uh, diagnosis for me. And uh, But then that cannot happen when you have Diagon uh, diagnostics radiology or diagnosis diagnostics available. Uh, so I think that way it becomes much more efficient. And the way things today are happening in the Western world, particularly in America, uh, UK, where the NHS is busting out of seam, I think these are very important uh, breakthroughs, uh, which will see a very stupendous adoption curve, uh, because uh, there is no way out. The other part where we have uh, had some play is essentially um, the complete uh, revolutionizing of the drug uh, delivery mechanism or even you know in the preventive part like we are uh, even today go for our annual checkups very diligently but whatever we are doing as annual checkup blood stool urine ecg treadmill they are not very accurate or they are not very helpful we today need to figure out more that what's the chance that today i'm non diabetic Five years hence, I can become diabetic. What's the chance that 10 years hence, I will become, I will have Alzheimer or I will have Parkinson. And even if I cannot cure them, can I return them? What's the chance of me getting cancer? And therefore, what could be the preventive measures that we can take? And towards this 2019, there was a Nobel Prize in chemistry given to two ladies, one French and one American. And that was for CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9 is basically a cutting tool that enables you to cut and join defective pieces of your gene. Now, before you can even do that, you need to sequence the gene. You need to edit the gene. You need to read the gene. And for that, technology was not available. Gene sequencing, if any of us have any remote encounter with anybody who has genetic disorders in our families or in distant families, friends, and whoever, we would have, we would have known that 25, 30,000 it used to require earlier days to sequence uh, a pair of uh, genes for uh, somebody having a genetic disorder, like say beta thalassemia and so on and so forth. But today, the technology has become so advanced that we are able to sequence gene pairs in less than $1,000. And hence from here, if we have a tool like CRISPR-Cas9, we expect that what we will be doing is basically going and doing gene sequencing every year uh, as part of our annual health checkup. And that will tell us you know, how the genes have uh, rewired themselves since the last one. And hence, where is the wearing gone wrong? And therefore, how can we correct that wearing very early in the day? So basically, you are uh, preventive. And not only preventive, you are preventive when you need uh, uh, just one stitch rather than nine stitches. Uh, so that's a very important way we see this whole world is going to uh, literally be uh, changing the way we approach all these things. And, um, and, and we believe that, you know, today these companies are going for a song. I mean, they have like $5 million uh, kind of a $5, five billion to $50 billion kind of market cap. But these are like all have the potential for trillion dollars in terms of market cap. Um, so this is where I guess there's a huge change coming in. And in between, there is another smaller areas like all of us, uh, you see, um, are different. Our genes are different. We look different. Our risk appetites are different. But when we have, say, a uh, sore throat, uh, all three of us go to the different doctors. All three doctors probably will give us uh, either an erythromycin or maybe an amoxicillin or maybe a clarithromycin. And that has a lot of side effects. 
uh, if you are not very careful, if your stomach is light, you will get diarrhea by the time you move into the second day. So in order to prevent all these things, we can get into single drug deliveries, uh, single doses, and these again are specifically catered. It's more like, uh, you know, a la carte, uh, based on our gene and the gene sequencing, essentially to prevent it from having side effects, but to treat the exact problem. If you manifest that into say even uh, 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 radiology and chemotherapy for cancer, you, you, you can take out all the side effects of chemotherapy, like hair loss, uh, like white blood cells being depleted. Uh, so from cosmetic to real ana an 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 anatomic, you can take out all these and make it a very uh, uh, easy flow for treatment of uh, even uh, dreaded things like cancer, where after 80, 90 years, we have not even been able to find a cure. There's no medicine still there and nothing is inside. So these are the three main areas where uh, we think there is a huge transition taking place. Uh, one is some of uh, so one, uh, the one end of the barbell is very deep tech. Mm. And the other end is uh, basically more uh, innovative execution, uh, which will come out of more necessity and need. And essentially when people like NHS, uh, uh, and that's uh, already they have started in a big way, if you really see the way uh, things happen there. So both in private, so these are now in public space, but then in the private space, this is all that is germinating and offers a huge amount of opportunity and potential. So Arjun, you've, you've actually been uh, more in the MNCs and big companies. So what is your take on uh, startups in uh, medtech? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to uh, resonate a couple of points that Devnil already made. I think early detection, prevention is a big part of the solution. So if we're able to detect diseases early, that also creates the issue of access. So if people are not crowding in the hospitals later on, uh, you can take treatments which are faster, probably even more economical. So that's a big piece of the solution here. Uh, so I, I really like what he was saying there. Uh, in terms of what role a, a startup, or maybe maybe I call it a broader than that, I'll just call it smaller companies. What role do they have to play in the healthcare ecosystem? Uh, I think uh, I think there is a big role. Let me start by saying that. Um, I think if you look at other industries, uh, which can be fairly oligopoly, the bigger the better. It seems to be the mantra all the time. Healthcare, we are fortunate. I think there's room for everybody. I think startups and smaller companies will play a very, very important role as we evolve, uh, finding that uh, system that we all want to eventually migrate to. Let me give you a couple of examples where I think startups play a big role. Uh, pro new product innovation. I think startups are nimbler. They have faster decision-making. They have smaller inherent cost bases. So they can churn around new products probably much faster than big technology companies or big pharma can do. So that's clearly a, a, a niche that smaller and, uh, and start, uh, smaller companies and startups can play in. Uh, when I talk about affordability, again, it's that low cost base allows them to probably have products that are equally good, give the right outcome at a fraction of the cost that today big companies are delivering. Right now, MedTech, a lot of them are big companies, not a lot of new innovation. So the outcomes are probably known, but the cost of it is very high. So is there some way to lower that? I think startups and, uh, uh, and uh, smaller companies have a disruptive role in that in order to make, a, because of the lower cost base that they have, they can bring to market products more economically. So which end the patient pays less or the government healthcare system or whatever pays much less. And that will allow access to a wider part of the population which today cannot afford those therapies. So I think the role of the startup in the ecosystem is extremely important. 